in South Korea. And the title will be Detecting Strong Lensed Quasars and Measuring Their Time Delays from Unresolved Light Curves. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so here I'll discuss the methods we developed for detecting the unresolved lens quasars and for measuring their time delays using the light curve data. And I'm Sadat Drubag, a postdoc at Kasi, and this, these people are in, involved in this project. So my previous uh, speakers explained why uh, the strong gravitational lensing and time delay cosmography are important in today's cosmology. So I'll speed up in this section. So basically the emerging tensions in different data sets are coming up, uh, uh, maybe be because of systematic, new physics or both, we don't know. So we need independent probes like strong lensing, JT, uh, gravitational wave cosmology. And very briefly, so the uh, gravitation potential of a massive foreground uh, galaxy can bend the light of, of, from a distant source and uh, like a quasar and then, then we see the uh, source in multiple images. And since the love, uh, light travels to different paths, we get uh, different magnifications and, 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 and for different gravitational potential too. And most importantly, uh, there are time delays between the images which can be used for independent cosmology. So typically a lens system is detected through a uh, high resolution imaging or spectr spectroscopic analysis. So this is the famous example of RxJ1131. And then the most important part is that uh, the, the individual image light curves for a quasar uh, uh, are, are monitored for several years. And that is the most uh, uh, expensive part here using the high resolution telescopes. And then uh, uh, from, from these image light curves, one can measure the time delays and with accurate lens modeling uh, that can be converted into the ratio of this angular diameter distances. And this ratio uh, can, uh, from this ratio, one can directly estimate the values of say H naught or can do uh, cosmology uh, independent of other probes like the, cosmo, uh, the cosmic distance ladder or the inverse ladder. So to measure the time day-to-day, one needs variable sources like a quasar or a supernova. Now I come, uh, yeah, so 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 uh, typically, so we, we have almost a couple of hundreds of lens of quasars already observed and only three confirmed lens supernovae. And the Cosmograil team's uh, team uh, monitors a few dozens of uh, lens quasars for precise time delay measurements. But unfortunately, all of them cannot be used for cosmology. For example, the Holy Cow team uh, using the six lens uh, quasars would measure H naught in Lambda CD model with just 2.4% uh, or 2.5% uncertainty. Okay, that number uh, increases in the updated TD Cosmo analysis. And also one can do a model independent estimation of H naught. Uh, but the things that uh, the, the, these are the individual posterior on the edge not for the uh, from the six uh, 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 lens quasars. So individually, the lens quasar can constrain the edge not up to five to ten percent. But the most important fact is that uh, when uh, so to, together they can tighten the constraint very much. So that is the main thing. So basically, if we had more lens systems, we can achieve much better accuracy. Now I come to the main part of the uh, the talk. So when the sources are spatially unresolved, we'll not see the individual image light curves. Rather, we'll see the sum of them, the, which we call the joint light curve. And these are some uh, schematic, also some some examples. So this is for a supernova, another supernova, and this is for a quasar. So the goal here is to identify these uh, or detect these unresolved lens system using the light curve data. And there are many advantages in this. Uh, in, in this approach. So we do not need to resolve the images a priori, neither we need a uh, high resolution uh, moni uh, monitoring of the individual image light curve. So this, this is uh, typically very expensive. And also we can scan through the light curve database in search of uh, the lens objects. And also it avoids any confusion between a binary uh, quasar or a double image quasar. So the fact is that the ongoing GTM and mainly the upcoming Rubin and Roman will observe many lens system. For example, Rubin alone will see hundred of hundreds of lens supernovae and maybe thousands of uh, lens quasar. But the catch is, uh, catch here is that 
a lot can remain unresolved. So the main goal of the whole uh, uh, the, the the talk is to detect these unresolved systems, and that will uh, boost the sample size, and that will in turn ensure better accuracy in this novel problem uh, probe of cosmology. So now uh, I said that there are two types of variable sources, supernovae and quasars, and both have their own advantages. So supernovae, the lens supernovae are extremely rare, but this is an emerging field. So maybe in the coming, uh, so the in in the coming decade, it it can be at the front frontier. So separately, we are also developing our tools to detect these unresolved uh, lens supernovae. But in this talk, I will focus on the lens quasars because they are much more abundant, and uh, the time delay cosmography still relies on them. So unresolved lens quasar. So uh, for simplicity, let us assume there are just two images. So the joint light curve, these red data points, are the sum of the underlying two image light curves, which are basically, uh, which can be described by the same function, but uh, with a scaling, the magnitude ratio, and the shift with the time tail. Now the main challenge here is that the quasar flux variability is highly stochastic and it is not well un un understood. So basically there is no constraint on the quasar uh, image, so intrinsic quasar uh, light curve. So that is, that there is no constraint on this function F F1. So the problem statement is very simple and very interesting and just a mathematical puzzle. So suppose uh, I give you this joint light curve, forget about the noise, just the amount uh, with the marginal noise, the blue uh, curve. Can you tell me that uh, this light curve is lensed or not? Or in other words, is this light curve a sum of the two copies or not? And the game of the rule is that there is no rule. So uh, there is no constraint on this function f1. So f1 can be anything. So this uh, seems like an impossible problem. You can always tell me that uh, uh, the, 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 the blue light curve itself is an intrinsic light curve. And since there is no constraint, I have to admit that. So the problem seems quite, in, uh, quite, quite, quite challenging. And due to the importance of the problem and the interesting nature, a few groups in last one and a half or two years have come up with different uh, methods. And without going into the details, I can say that none of them are completely model independent. And this is very important because uh, any assumption on the quasar flux variability can lead to a biased results. So how do we do, do that? So we again start with the joint light curve and we cannot model this image light curve. F1, but rather from this equation, we can reconstruct the image light curve by just successive substitution. So this, this step is a trivial step, but I'm omitting the mathematics here. So basically you can see that this sum converges for mu less than one or the magnificent ratio uh, less than one. That means we are basically reconstructing the brighter image because for the brighter image, the mu, uh, the magnitude ratio should always be less than one. So we are not losing any generality here. But the problem we immediately notice that there exists an unique solution for any choice of this mu trial or, or any, any trial of a choice of mu and delta t. That means given a joint light curve, you can choose any value of mu and delta t and you are guaranteed to get an unique solution. So this points to a mathematical degeneracy because any choice of mu and delta t are allowed. And this has been uh, also pointed out two decades ago. We, we just found this out later. But they conclude that without assuming any additional information, proceeding forward is impossible. So let, let us check if that is the case. So I will reiterate here that given a joint la, la, light curve, so any choice of mu and del, delta t gives you an unique solution, but that solution actually recovers the underlying image light curve only if the mu and delta t are the truth, or are same as the truth, but with different mu and delta t, you will get different uh, image la, light curve, but you will always recover the joint light curve exactly. So now let us focus on some of the uh, reconstructed image light curve or some of the solutions. So for simplicity, let us uh, fix the trial magnitude ratio to an arbitrary value. And here I plot uh, three reconstructed image light curves corresponding to three different time delays. The dashed blue is corresponding to the true time delay and the uh, red and the green are uh, for wrong time delays. And the right panel actually basically zooms into the uh, left panel. So here you can clearly see that the 
green or the red curves show more fluctuation than the dashed blue curve. So this is the thing we noticed in all the cases that we get more fluctuations in the reconstructed image light curve when that, that is reconstructed using a wrong time delay. So in other words, a wrong so for wrong time delay, the solutions, the reconstructed image light curve show more, show, shows more fluctuation than the true one. So that is the heart of this whole, uh, uh, the, 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 that is the heart of the analysis here. So now the main thing is that how do we measure the fluctuation? So we use this simple metric, which is basically the uh, sum of the square the distances in a time series. And, and, and this is how we measure the fluctuations. So now we construct the whole algorithm. So given a joint light curve, we first fix our trial magnitude ratio to an arbitrary value. Then we reconstruct the image light curve for a bunch of different trial time delays. And for each one of them, we calculate the fluctuations in the reconstructed image light curve. And then after normalization, we plot that uh, fluctuation against the uh, trial time delay and that we call the fluctuation curve. So this means that each point here measures the amount of fluctuation uh, that is uh, present in the reconstructed image light curve using this trial time delay. So now we will look for the local minima in, in this plot. So first, uh, before going to that, we observe some interesting ca characteristic that this fluctuation curve is uh, symmetry around zero, and there is a global minima. So this minima is always there, regardless of the system being lensed or not. So we can ignore this. But the, interestingly, when the trial time delay matches the true time delay, we see a pair of symmetric uh, secondary minima at plus minus of the true time delay. And this vanishes if the system was unlensed. So by detecting this pair of secondary minima, we can identify the system as lensed. And the location can uh, estimate the time delay very precisely. And all these three uh, empirical observations stands valid for different choice of uh, trial magnitude ratio. So this method is insensitive to the magnitude ratio, but it can detect the uh, uh, lens system and at the same time can measure the time delay very accurately. Now, if you're wondering that why these characteristics are coming in the uh, uh, fluctuation curve, then just hold on to that. We, 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 we uh, dig deep into the mathematical foundation of this fluctuation curve in a separate paper. And at the end, uh, in one slide, I'll very briefly explain that why these, uh, the, the, these features are appearing in the fluctuation curve. So the, the next is just validation. So we, we, we test uh, this method on a bunch of simulated systems. So, uh, uh, so, so considering different uh, uh, types of flux variability. So the blue curves are uh, the best quality data with marginal noise and the red data points are with JTF like noise. And when we apply this method on this 10, uh, 10 lane system, we uh, see that for all of them, uh, when the uh, trial time delay matches the true one, we get a pair of secondary minima. And using that, we could identify all the system as lensed. Actually, not all of them. So for this one, the secondary minima was not strong enough, but this is just not a ran random system. The, for this system, uh, the, the second image was too faint. It was just 10% of the joint la light curve. So it is understandable that why the method fails here. And at the same time, we apply that method for uh, some simulated online systems, and we see that the uh, fluctuations are almost same, but the secondary, uh, uh, the pair of secondary minima here vanishes, so we identify all these systems as unlensed. So till now, we, sorry, sorry, one thing I forgot to mention here. So here we basically um, applied the method on the uh, uh, high quality data with marginal noise. Now the yeah, so here, uh, because of that, our time delay estimations are spot on. So for all these nine systems, we, we estimate the time delay very accurately. And we also tested uh, the, uh, the method on a blind set, having uh, 10 lanes and 10 unlane systems when we could recover all of them correctly. So in combination of the, so uh, the blind and the validation set, we get the precision or the purity, recall and accuracy all close to the 100%. So this is for the high quality data with marginal noise. So the next, uh, the, the only important thing left is how do, how, how do we deal with the observation noise? So our prescription is that the smooth, the noisy light curve. And then 
then then feed the smooth light curve for example this black curve the smooth light curve into a previous algorithm that means using the smooth light curve you re reconstruct the image light curve for different trial time periods and try to minimize the fluctuations in them and then the next question arises that what smoothing scale to choose and to be agnostic we advocate that we should, uh, one should choose multiple smoothing scale and at the end combine the uh, fluctuation curves corresponding to each of these smoothing scale to get the final fluctuation curve which for this case is this so here you can see that again this prominent pair of secondary minima identifies the system as lens and it can also uh, uh, estimate the time delay uh, quite accurately. So next, we apply this method on the same validation and line set, but now with GTM like noise. So uh, in, in combination of the, uh, the known and the blind set, we could recover uh, actually 12 out of 20 lens systems. And so the re recall is 60%, and we get only one false positive case, namely this one. So the precision is still over 92%, sorry 90 per percent so they, this is with gtm like noise and in all these lens cases uh we we we, we actually recover the time that is very accurately most within just three percent and this is uh summarized in this paper so we also uh test this method on a bunch of other simulations but here i'll show that how it works on the real data so this is the light curves of uh, light curve of this uh lens quasar system sdss j12260606 so this uh, lens system is uh, lens quasar system is monitored by cosmography so they basically monitor these two image light curves the blue and the green one for 14 years and we actually them to make our joint light cup and we work with uh, or work with that so these 14 patches can be treated uh, separately but the problem is that some of the patches have large gaps so we cannot use them so when you discard them we are left with the four good patches and these, these are the corresponding uh, fluctuation curves and when we add this fluctuation curve we arrive to this. Again, this uh, symmetric pair of uh, secondary minima identifies the system as lens, and based on this uh, location of the minima, we estimate the time delay to be close to 30 days, which matches very well with what Cosmogrel team found. But remember that Cosmogrel team found it using these two resolved uh, light curves, and we uh, got it from the joint light curve, and they match well. Now, there's one important test left that we apply the same algorithm but not on the joint light curve but on the on one of the intrinsic quasar light curve so we expect that no spurious lensing should be found and the uh, and the resulting uh substitution curve uh, looks like this and here we don't see a pair of symmetric pair of secondary minima so this is classified as unless so uh, this this also tests the sanity check so now very briefly i'll explain that why the fluctuation curve is so successful so here we just substitute the expression uh, of the reconstruction into the fluctuation uh, so the measurement of the so the metric for the uh, measuring the fluctuation and after some uh, man manipulation the fluctuation curve can be expressed in as as this so here basically this h is the difference between the successive points in the joint light curve. So for a uniformly sampled data, this H is basically derivative, the derivative of the joint light curve. And see that this is a constant term. This term doesn't have the uh, delta T, means we, we plot it against the trial time delay, and this is a constant term. And, and these terms are suppressed because the mu uh, is, is basically less than one and actually can be substantially less than one. So the higher order terms can be neglected. So all of the signal in the fluctuation curve, so this, this is a typical fluctuation curve coming from this part. And if you look closely, this is just the autocorrelation function. This is the autocorrelation function in, uh, of the derivative of the joint light curve. And when we plot for this system, only up to the first order in mu, we get this orange curve. So you, you can see that in the fluctuation curve, most of the signal is coming from this part, the autocorrelation in the derivative. And this is the joint light curve here. So this is again uh, the, in the best case scenario with uh, marginal noise. And you can see that the autocorrelation of the joint light curve gives us nothing. But the autocorrelation of the derivative gives us these um, secondary peaks, which are manifested in the uh, secondary minima in the uh, fluctuation curve because of this negative sign. So the peaks here uh, becomes a minima. So basically, uh, this paper actually 
uh, explore some very interesting features. So first is that the lensing signal co is coming from the autocorrelation of the derivative. And for all the red uh, power spectrum, that means if as long as the quasar flux variability has a correlation in time, the ACF of H means the ACF of derivative will perform better than the autocorrelation of the joint light curve itself. This is guaranteed. And since the fluctuation curve is based on the uh, ACF of H, so it, it also performs better than the, uh, the, the autocorrelation of the joint light curve. But when we tested on noisy data, we found that the fluctuation curve performs better than the ACF of the derivative because of these harder terms. And also both of them can detect the quartz system. Although the fluctuation curve analysis based on just two images, it can still detect the quartz system because ACF of H can. So in summary, the main challenge of this uh, whole endeavor is that the quasar flux variability cannot be more modeled. And we proposed a novel technique based on the minimization of the fluctuations in the reconstructed image light curves. And we show that it's possible to detect the lens, uh, unresolved lens quasars without assuming anything on the uh, quasar flux variability, not uh, requiring any additional information. We tested on uh, different simulations, including the time DT, the challenge one. And we showed that it works well on the existing data quality and it can detect the quartz system. And, 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 and the works are basically summarized in these two papers. And in future, there are a lot can be done. And I'm, I'm just outlining a few important ones. So first is the refining the method. So we are analyzing a large number of simulations in the variety of uh, observational scenarios, like with different noise levels, cadence, microlet, lensing. So that will not only show the effect of these different observation uh, conditions, but also help us uh, do, do the proper error analysis and this will also tell us uh, the favor of observation strategy. And also one can improve the selection criteria using the deep learning because the fluctuation curve actually has this higher order, uh, information that actually puts some predictable features. And uh, yes, and we are validating on all the cosmogonal systems. So the early results show that we could recover uh, up to 50% of these systems using just the joint light curve. Now we are carrying out a, a, a source for the squeezers in the GTF light curve database. These are all warming up. The main goal is to make it ready for LSST by optimizing with after the phase two recommendation uh, for the observing strategy becomes public. And, 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 and by building the pipeline, we, we can take advantage of the early data. So thank you and thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Thank you. Thank you, Zetadra, for the nice talk. Any questions from the audience? There is one. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, could you explain, sorry for very uh, maybe basic question, but could you explain why after correlation function wouldn't work for any type of signal? Why do we need this um, math you presented today? Thank you. Oh yeah, so so this is actually a technical question. So if the question is that the autocorrelation, so ACF stands for the autocorrelation function. So why the autocorrelation on the joint light curve doesn't work, but the autocorrelation on the derivative works? Actually, this is a technical question, but I'll try to answer here in, in a graphical manner. So when the, the, the joint light curve has a, a correlation in, 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 so it's correlated in time or, or the intrinsic quasar uh, light curve is correlated in time. So the joint light curve will also be correlated in time, of course. But the problem is that the correlation scale is quite large. So that means that you can see that even if I ship this joint light curve a bit, you would not expect a lot of change in the autocorrelation function. Right. And, and, and this can be also explained very well in the Fourier space because when there is a time correlation, the power spectrum would be a red type. But when you take a derivative in the time space, then that means we are multiplied, uh, multiplying by omega square in the Fourier space. So that makes the power spectrum more flatter. 
So the power spectrum of this light car, sorry, the, the derivative will be flatter than the power spectrum of this. And that means that here, the correlation is much less than here. And that is reflected in the autocorrelation function. But, but I think that I could answer it better. So the, this paper actually answered it better, but if you are convinced, then I'll stop here. Otherwise, I, I can also show some of the results from this preprint. Okay, uh, any more questions? We have still some time. Okay, I have one very quick question. Um, does your uh, method make any assumption about the stationarity of the time series? Uh, by stationarity, are you saying that uh, is it uh, prone to a uh, Is it vulnerable to microlensing or not? So whether oh, or okay. not your autocorrelation function changes as a function of time. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yes. So, 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 yes, yes. So, so uh, the 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 whole method or the the method which shows that why the fluctuation curve works assumes that the quasar uh, uh, flux variability is 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 state. Uh, white sand stationary is not exactly stationary, but there's the mathematical terms that the white sand stationary. That means that its covariance properties remain same, uh, same under the translation in time domain. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. So this concludes the first part of session two. I guess we'll have the lunch now. Do you want to add anything?